Welcome to One Week Critiques, the interview series. I'm Adam Alsergani, and I'm here today with Francisco Cantu. Welcome, Francisco. Thanks for having me, Adam. Francisco, or Paco, as I'm bound to call him 17 times, is a writer, translator, and author of The Line Becomes a River, which was the winner of the 2018 Los Angeles Times Book Prize and a finalist for the National Critic Book Critics Circle Award in Nonfiction. He's a former Fulbright Fellow and has been the recipient of a Pushcart Prize, a Whiting Award, and an Art for Justice Fellowship. His writing and translations have appeared, among other places, in Best American Essays, Harper's, The New Yorker, and Guernica, as well as On This American Life. One of the most exciting moments in my life, and this is a true thing, is I'm a big listener to BBC Radio, and I once woke up to your dulcet tones and thought, shit, I've made it. I know someone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> BBC. Um, Paco, you're also, um, you live in Tucson. You've lived in the Southwest your whole life. You teach at the University of Arizona and coordinate the field studies and writing program. Is there anything else folks ought to know about you? Gosh, no, um, nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think that, yeah, that about covers it. Right. <laughs> um, so usually what we do at the top of the program, Paco, is we, uh, we have someone read a little bit off the top of whatever they've written, and then they can find, uh, for the sake of study and comparison, those things on our website, oneweekcritique.com, which is the number one week critique.com. Cool. Um, so this is, this is from uh, an, an early draft of the essay uh, Lines of Sight about WGC Bald. On either side of the train, the vast mud fields of East Anglia stretched out in every direction. For several minutes, I stared out the windows with great confusion, trying to make sense of the metallic domes laid with geometric order across the passing landscape. Clustered around the domes were pink shapes. Pigs, I finally realized, chewing mindlessly as they stared down at the ground or sprawled out in the dirt as if preparing for death. The domes, I guessed, were there to offer shelter to the animals during the frequent rain, or perhaps were there merely to keep dry the endless supply of food meant to fatten them. I exited the train at Halesworth to, and made my way to a nearby bus stop to wait for a bus that would take me within walking distance of Dunwich on the Suffolk coast. On the Suffolk coast. When the bus finally came, long after I had hoped, I found not a single soul on board except for the driver, who seemed positively disappointed by my presence. When I exited the bus less than 15 minutes later, I heard the man utter a distinct sigh of relief. As I made my way along the highway's narrow shoulder, I could hear the screaming of pigs barely concealed from view behind the brush at the side of the road. I soon turned onto the small country road that led to Dunwich, which led away from the midfields and into the woods, where the only sounds to be heard were the, cr were the crowing of pheasants and the far-off breaking of waves washing over a darkening shore. So, Paco, uh, you're a writer of nonfiction at, whose expertise is both very much in library, like book work and experiential work. And that's going to come out much more clearly in this essay and several of your other pieces of fiction. But over the trajectory of your work, you've started to develop, I can't remember exactly what you called it, to me in one of our exchanges, but something like a hybrid essay, cultural think piece, literary criticism, personal adventure narrative. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if that's, if that's being driven by that connection between the work you do that involves looking at stats and looking at work in international relations and oh, interesting. Um, the kind of travel and the way in which your personal life has come into the narrative. You know, I think if I had to trace the trajectory of that sort of hybrid of, of personal narrative and um, travel writing and, and kind of cultural criticism or more like sum summarization, um, 
of of sort of like journalistic and reported facts, you know, the kind of like hard nonfiction stuff. Um, you know, I think like actually to hear you mention, you know, uh, studying international relations as I did as an as an undergraduate, I hadn't really thought of that. I feel like a, a lot of times as writers, we think of um, our you know, like our real writing life as as have as starting when we, you know, finally get into an MFA or when we finally start publishing pieces in journals or something like that. Um, and, and that is maybe my tendency as well. But I think it's totally true that, you know, like I've always enjoyed writing the academic essay and like, I, you know, like that was the thing that I did good at in school was, you know, like turning in the, the essay for my... Um, you know, my rural development class and my, and international relations or whatever. Um, and, you know, like within the MFA program, um, you know, I think there, like the, a lot of that writing is, is, is a lot of times introduced to you in a siloed way in nonfiction, right? It's like, oh, like here's some travel writing. Here's some, you know, like, hardcore history nonfiction historical reconstruction of of scenes and um and stuff like that and and then here's the lyric essay here's the personal essay um and and of course like that gets broken down in in any good program by any good instructor um but you know in the work that became the in my thesis which ended up becoming my first book there there were very much these um uh these vignettes that were straight up sort of personal personal narrative, personal history, um, and then interspersed with um, kind of historical reconstructions um, or kind of like, you know, very like brief info dumps from um, news, newspapers about what was happening on, on the border since that was a subject of the first book, um, you know, different historical trends and developments and stuff like that. Um, and so I think... With the new, um, something that happened since my book came out is uh, I started to get invitations to review books um, in, in, in different um, magazines and papers. Um, and that was felt totally new to me, um, being put in the role of cr critic, cultural critic, literary critic, um, by, you know, any, any like institution at all <laughs> that, that had recognition, you know, the only time I had ever really done that was in school and in conversation and craft classes and stuff like that. Um, and it, I really enjoyed it. I found that I, you know, like at first I felt a little out of my comfort zone. Um, but I, I really enjoyed placing, um, work in conversation, um, a work in conversation with other works and with, histories and um you know journalism and stuff like that and so th that felt like a new introduction into this sort of budding repertoire i guess of of styles um and and it was really with this essay which is when you asked me which essay I, i'd be interested in in talking about th this essay is sort of the first essay of i think you know what will be a collection of essays of uh, my next book project that very much um, runs in this hybrid, very much traffics in this hybrid sort of travel narrative, literary criticism slash cultural criticism slash personal narrative. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there because we'll dig into it more, I'm sure. Yeah, so I think one phenomenal thing that is not immediately apparent in the section of the essay that you read is that the main thread of Lines of Sight is actually about you hunting down W.G. Zabal in relation to his work in Rings of Saturn in particular. And I think um, someone who, as a writer, strikes me as very much in conversation with you in many compelling and strange ways is, for those who don't know very well or who aren't terribly familiar with him, a German born at the end of the Second World War who deals with often his own complicity in the German cultural experience leading up to that war and its atrocities. Um, and often in a little bit of an angle, I'm hoping you can tell me though a little bit about why the rings of Saturn in particular and why 
go all the way to East Anglia to stand where he stood as opposed to any other way of engaging in this book. You know, I think uh, alongside, I think, you know, the answer um, that I just gave, um, you know, getting offered to sort of like review books does this interesting thing where I think it suddenly like someone has given you permission. I think so much of writing is is about like what we finally give ourselves permission to do or what we feel like we have permission to to write about. Um, And writing about somebody like WGC Bald, who I think, you know, in the last few decades has just reached a a place of enormous stature um, in in international literature, Um, you know, like giving myself permission to be in conversation with him and to write about him as opposed to what comes much more naturally to me, which is just like quoting from his work, right? Or, um, or, you know, just like keeping it siloed, staying in your lane. Um, and, and so, you know, I took this trip like a year before I wrote, before I actually wrote the essay, I knew I wanted to write something for a long time. I just like the only writing that really materialized out of the trip was a bunch of notes and like a Twitter thread <laughs> with pictures. Um, and um, I guess how I got there was uh, that I, I was, um, my my book got published in the UK, um, which is w- where I um, must have done some BBC interview <laughs> that you heard. Um, and so the, the, the publisher brought me to um, the UK to do like a, a five day, you know, little publicity thing in London. Um, And I extend, I extended my trip. I asked if they could give me an extra week on my ticket or whatever. And, and, and so then I, um, I I planned this whole trip after that Uh, publicity little blitz was over. I, I took the train to East Anglia and did this whole Seabald walking thing and just tried to cover as much ground as I could. You know, uh, Rings of Saturn was the first book that I've, that I read by him. Um, and I think, you know, it's the book that is most grounded in a single landscape. I think like in a lot of his other books, he, um, traverses, um, broader swaths of, of landscape or, you know, like the, the narrator is here and there all across Europe. Whereas in, um, Rings of Saturn, you know, it's, it's anchored by this walking tour, uh, by this, this walking trip along the coast and that anchor, um, you know, I, th- I, I, it was interesting to put yourself in that same anchor as a fan of this person, as somebody who's been influenced by him, even without knowing that I would write this essay. I, I knew that that was an, an anchor of like taking the same trail and, and just seeing where it, like everything else was up in the air, like seeing what thoughts, what, questions what you know like I did no research other than um like where did I have to stay at night and how many miles could I walk each day and what you know what towns had he had he been in you know like the only book I had brought was 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 his um and then you know some research on like where I could stay at a and b I love that I also I'm happy to know that other writers or at least another writer has a tendency to glom on a project into existing trips and to like make Oh, that's the that's the only way to live. Yeah. I mean if you get a if if you get a trip somewhere or an invitation somewhere, um yeah, make it work for you for, for you. Yeah. yeah. So one other I would argue type of research you're doing here, and it's really hard to talk about. In my mind it's hard to talk about say bald and not talk a little bit about how he uses one photographs and two kind of a wavy line between fiction and nonfiction. Um, And in your earlier version of the essay, in the later version of the essay, you have photographs in it um, that you've taken, some of which are a little more sort of meta picture of the picture of the landscape. and some less so. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about the choices to connect to him in that particularly intimate way, and then how that kind of photographing becomes part of the story that you end up telling. Yeah, I mean, I guess being 
being on these trips like the the trip provides the organizational logic of of the piece um and and i guess you know why this is an interesting piece to discuss with you because it you know un, unbeknownst to me at the time like it would become the blueprint for several other trips um i ended up doing like a series of these kind of of essays in this vein in the same vein for the Virginia Quarterly Review. Um, and, and so, you know, like, I guess to answer your question directly, the, 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 the pictures that I was taking were just as like a, a form of, of research and note taking and capturing. Um, I, you know, I think there were the things that I, you know, I just wanted to have like a visual log of, um, uh, as a, alongside the notes. Um, and there were also things that I was very much, you know, that spoke directly to an image in the book, spoke directly, whether it's a visual image or, or an image in the writing. Um, and, and then, you know, other things that just sort of spoke directly to like a mood that grows out of the book. Um, or, you know, and I, I think it's like on the on the Seaball trip, this happened more than on any of the other trips where um, uh, a friend of mine once describes Seaball's writing uh, or Seaball as an author as as being an author who colonizes the mind <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of anybody who attempts to write about him. Um, and we'll talk about this later, but I think that's probably one of the big the 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 biggest most important edits that I got from my editor at the Virginia Quarterly Review was to uh to start weeding out all those places where I was just writing in Seabald's voice which was fun which was fun and it I, it was less about me trying to be Seabald and more just like like it just felt like a um like this really w- weird exercise right um and 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 you felt like you could maybe get away with it because you had been there right because you had like been on that trip and you had been um in your mind seeing and interfacing with a lot of these same things and because for me you know having really no ties to this landscape to to east anglia or or the suffolk coast um or or england um you know like his book was my my own my re- only real frame of reference for that landscape so as soon as i got off the train like the seabald vibes were everywhere and it became very difficult to sort of parse out like what observations and um feelings <laughs> and thoughts i was having you know were 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 really my own or were you know inherent to the place were like stemming inherently from an, the nature of the place itself versus just like what had been placed there by this writer um and and then of course the question became like well you know how how is that true in different orders of magnitude culturally right when when somebody becomes a cultural figure when a certain uh work becomes a canonical piece of work influences the way that we think about place the, the way that entire cultures think about place yeah um i think there's a lot of phenomenal stuff to parse there. I'm really interested in your activity of writing as Zabald accidentally or not, um, and w- how tough that is. I think there's, um, someone once told me about what he considered tractor beam sentences, like these a way of writing that kind of sucks you in and there's nothing else in your world for a little while, which I think is very much um, how Zabald works. Um, because there are a lot of other things, I'm going to back us up a little bit. I'm going to read more directly from my notes, maybe more than usual because of the many, many things going on in your text. Um, I'd like to jump back to The Line Becomes a River, um, your first book which came out in 2018. Um, this might be the longest conversation I've ever had with or about you without mentioning the fact that you were once a Border Patrol agent. Um, <laughs> which is which is great, which is great for me. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of which, uh, 
obviously, uh, it wasn't the favorite time or your favorite time in your life. And that book becomes about your stress dreams. It becomes about history. It becomes about the Mexican-American borders, a place, your own ethnic heritage, and negotiating all of these different things. And once in that book, you have this moment where you despair about the sort of academically unsolvable problem of getting rid of the border, um, capital B here. Um, and so escaping the border in that book, it's, the border itself is politicized, it's bureaucratized, and the people who interact with it engage what Hannah Arendt would call banal evil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that it's something that they're doing because they're often incapable of thinking of thinking what they're doing and not thinking just about what they're doing and their own personal needs um, out of it. And that creates a lot of systemic violence. Um, and I think you start to work in that book toward answers about how to get past that academically unsolvable problem. Some of the ways that I think you hint towards are more humane, more individualized engagements. I think Lines of Sight touches on that time and it moves toward these other kinds of narratives. And of course, Zabald is working through often in the Rings of Saturn, definitely in the emigrants, um, about dealing with the consequences of the Nazi era. Um, and I'm wondering if for you, this is a way to start moving toward commentary or thinking about what next action is or what the next mm. thing to do is um, beyond um, facing history itself, but also facing history as a long-term process. Hmm. I think something that to me um, is so profound about Seabald, and I guess I should say that, you know, I first read Seabald when I was in the Border Patrol um, very early on, like I was still just kind of getting oriented. So I don't think I was conscious as I was reading Seabald of, of, of reading, um, of, of, of having like a map in my hand um, that spoke to like the work that I was doing. Um, but, you know, I think what strikes me now about Seabald, um, you know, like one of the qualities of him as an author that I think, you know, gets, gets, gets talked about a lot um, and, you know, turns some people off, but the people who, who love him, that love this about him is that, you know, he, he, he goes on these extraordinary tangents, right. And, <laughs> and, and he moves so, uh, fluidly and, and wily through history um, um, and and through geography, right? Like all, all across, um, you know, the, the, the globe, often the colonial globe. Um, and, and so it feels like he's a writer who is, you know, doing these sort of like encyclopedic um, downloads and, and, um traversements if that's a <laughs> correct conjugation of um of you know through through history and time and subject matter but i think you know like the but then what you realize about Seabald is that he's always writing about the holocaust and 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 i think that like that's um there's a, there's a like a really amazing interview with him on Michael Silverblatt's bookworm. Um, so just anybody who's listening Google's that interview. I think there's a there's a YouTube stream of it, and and he and he he says essentially that um, um, you know in a in a much more astute way. Um, you know, and he 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 says quite directly that like he that it is too much to write about the Holocaust and World War II and and your, your complicity in it by different degrees of proximity 
Um, and, and so that, you know, like the way in that he found was to, to, to approach it sideways or through the back door. Um, and, and so like these tangents, right, they become these um, really unexpected entry points in, into that interrogation. Um, and, and I think like, to me, um, maybe not just living on the border in general, but I guess like living on the border in the way that I have and, and being implicated in the way that I now am in, you know, what, and in, in the, 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 the violence that the border can represent and, um, and, and meet out, um, you know, I I think like there's a, there's just a deep resonance for me because that also feels like it's it feels like it's true that like no matter what I look at, um, that will always be in the back of my mind, right? Like and 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 that is true in sometimes very obvious ways, right? Like if I go on a hike in the desert, um, you know, anywhere within like an hour of the border, um, th- this happened the other day. Um, I was I was with a friend and we were camping close to the border and there was a, he- a helicopter, um, a border patrol helicopter in the distance, which I knew was, um, you know, har- harassing some migrants, you know, the whole time we were talking, you know, having a nice time. <laughs> and, and we, we, and we came to that a couple times because this friend is somebody who had actually crossed the border as a, um, in, in their life. And, and, you know, that, experience was something that was about you know it was related to this camping trip but it also felt very far from this camping trip like the actual reality of like us hanging out around a campfire and 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 drinking mezcal and 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 having a nice time um and then you know it was this thing that we kept returning to and then and then it turns out like that that the next morning there was this very visual manifestation of something that we both knew to be true that there are people moving through this landscape on either side of us um, and, and that is never not true. Like you, I mean, um, since the nineties, like if you drive from Tucson down to any border town, east or west from here, like, and you look south, um, you're looking over a landscape that is probably being actually traversed, like right, like right while you're looking at it. And if not, and if not, you know, at that moment, um, you know, it is full of the, full of the the very physical um direct reverberations of that yeah um i think i'm particularly interested in this not only because it's a big subject of your work it's a big subject of zabald's work in a kind of late existentialist way right like he's he's born too late and you mentioned this in your text that he's born too late to have been a Nazi to be directly involved in any way in any of the crimes that Nazis committed, whether it's the Holocaust itself or other sort of racial injustices or movements into other nations and violations of people. Um, And yet this is a thing that obsesses him. And I have thought a lot about your career and not only are you the only person I know uh, that I can think of anyway, who's been on BBC radio, you're also the only person I know who's actively had protesters of your readings and um, of your work, which is a very particular burden of your complicity and, and of the activity that you're undertaking to try and speak to that time and experience and what you've learned. Um, for me, one of the more interesting characters that appears in Lines of Sight, the essay we're talking about, is your friend Christoph, who you met while as an undergraduate, and he ends up speaking to you about, he's dying of cancer at the time you're visiting him, and he ends up speaking to you about the feeling of being angry at his parents for taking care of him and wanting to die, to be rid of that. And mm-hmm. I mentioned this to you before, that moment reminds me of uh, a poem of Alison Demings, who's a mutual mentor of ours, where mm-hmm. I think the line is, um, someone's mad at me for the nice thing I've done. Um, I think it's a really quietly complicated and mature thought. It's hard to it's hard to face those moments. And I think Christoph is way too young 
to be having that kind of realization. And mm. I, I think there are these interesting moments between Zabal, between your own narrative, between Christoph having to mature towards his own death in these new ways, between the changing landscape that speak to not only complicity, which I think is the main question of this essay, but to what does and doesn't cohere within a community or within mm -hmm. a life. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on what binds a work with this many threads and what binds it for you personally. I, that's a great question. And I think that something unique about this essay, because it is in conversation with Siebald, is that you know, traversing the space, um, the 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 sort of mental space of Seabal that he opens up in the book, and then traversing that landscape physically that he's traversing in the book. It again to talk about permission. It sort of like uh, opens up. It, it sort of like gives you permission to wander a little bit more further than you might be. Um, prone to wander in your own writing practice, um, you know, because of as the, the aforementioned tangents that he is sort of famous for. Um, and, and so like one of those wanderings um, that made its way in, you know, very prominently into my notes was the fact that as I was walking through Rendlesham forest, which sort of figures in the final part of the rings of Saturn, um, as I was fumbling with my phone to take a picture, um, you know, the iPhone has these pre, uh, pre-made slideshows. Um, and, and one of those popped up and it was, you know, on this day three years ago or whatever. And it was pictures of that trip, um, that I had made to see my friend Christoph. Um, and so that is where he, you know, I, I wouldn't have otherwise been thinking of him on that trip, and and he he wouldn't have otherwise been a part of this essay, I don't think. But he he became as I was, sort of taking that out of my notes and into the potential writing of this piece. Um, you know, I hadn't actually really thought about why I was so interested in in, you know, just it felt right, and a lot of times that's why things end up in the essay. But you know, when you sh shared with me some of your questions ahead of time um you know i started to think a little bit more about like what does this person this friend represent in this essay and i think you know that he is somebody who i think you know in in the dynamics of this essay you have the narrator who's who's um you know telling the reader that they are drawn to Seabald, who is the other main figure of of this essay because of the way that he interrogates c complicity and and then the narrator is talking about different kinds of complicity that they are part of and then you know Christoph as a character um for the reader of of this essay is not complicit as we know in anything right like like this is a person who was a friend of the narrator at a at a at a time prior to this complicity that's on the table um and so there's a friendship and a relationship and a youth that I think that that person still represents. But then, you know, in the essay, that person is dying. And, and I don't know, like, what, you know, I don't think that there is any sort of, like, sense or grand takeaway from that. But I think that just that fact alone felt like it belonged and, and felt like it was worthy of some... Um, I guess because the essay is asking a question about, you know, like, can we return to prior ways of seeing a landscape? And I think, you know, Christoph re represents, um, you know, a, a person who can't return to that prior moment either, but for, di for very different reasons. Um, and so it just becomes, you know, like another possible answer to that question. Um, absolutely. Um, so... I think anyone who's made this far with us is going to be a little surprised that, in fact, we've talked about a very limited number of the threads in this particular piece. <laughs> um, Christoph, I think, is a, a really anchoring one. He ends up in the end essay not being sort of volume-wise all that much. I'm wondering 
um, if you can speak to two things. One um, is that you actually got to um, come back to England later on and visit um, an exhibition about W.G. Zabald and get to see some of his photographs, some of his like personal effects, um, and encounter sort of how he edits his own many threads and processes and makes choices. Um, and you, of course, like anyone who's on a trip, you manage to write this entire essay and not talk about the fact that you're on England or you're in England on book tour or um, any of these other things that go on. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, how you're sort of picking threads and yarns and, and choosing them to put together in an essay that's blossoming and what are some of the other things that you chose and why? Well, I think, um, yeah, I guess there's, a, I'm already writing so much about myself and positioning myself, you know, so much in, in the essay that kind of like any, any extra parts that are sticking out to prevent the, you know, aerodynamic travel, um, you know, like, shed, shed, you know, I'm always looking to shed that. And so, you know, the kind of like, why did I make it to England in the first place? It was like, you know, for the purposes of this essay, like I'm here because of Seabold. Um, and, um, and, and then I guess to take that question a few um, steps further into the editing process, which I know, um, you know, which I think is such a, a great part of what, you know, you bring with this conversation and looking at the two different versions, um, you know, and, and thinking about the editorial processes, you know, my, my editor, Paul Reyes at, um, the Virginia Quarterly Review, as I sort of mentioned before, I think, you know, he saw his print, one of his principal tasks as minimizing, um, Seabald's voice um, in my writing um, and and m making my writing more obviously mine <laughs> in my voice, so to so to speak. Um, and you know, another thing that across all three of the essays that I've written with him now, um, that he just has a great radar for. I think in the I driven personal narrative essay form is um, removing the moments where the reader is watching you uh, see or perceive or feel a thing. Um, and, and, you know, like minimizing any moment in which like the narrator is becoming more of a middleman than they need to be between the, um, the thing that's trying to be communicated to the reader. And so, um, you know, in this essay, like if you look at the first version and, and the last version, um, there's all these moments of just kind of like me looking at my phone or me standing here and thinking and observing and, and, and just kind of like a lot of times all it amounts to is like taking out <laughs> the um, I saw <laughs> and then I blank um, and then I thought X and and just um you know rendering a sentence th that is the observation that that narrator saw so that so that the the reader is just sort of observing it more directly um and i feel like now i'm a little bit f far from your your question but i think you know being in this the seabald exhibition was another weird version of that because you know um, I had already made this trip. Um, I already, you know, felt like I had inhabited his work and his book, this particular book, by having taken that trip. Um, and, you know, the only way that I ended up at that exhibition was because I had taken this trip and made the aforementioned Twitter post with, like, a bunch of pictures. And a lot of Seabald nerds on the Internet had... You know, they were like, oh, cool, like an updated picture of that, you know, of, of the Dunwich ruins or whatever. And like now, you know, we we know like 
we know that we love that picture in Seabald's book, and here's the updated version of it. And so it got passed around, and, and that's how I ended up getting like um, in touch with this curator who was like, we're putting together an, an exhibition of you know a lot of his unpublished photos and um and it turned out that i was um again in europe for like another thing and and had uh, the timing worked out that i could hop over and see that exhibition and when you're in the exhibition hall you're again seeing this other like you're seeing all these photographs that haven't been published of seaball they're just like from you know his 24-hour photo sleeve um, you know, if, if, if any listeners remember going to the 24 hour Photoshop and getting that sleeve of 32 pictures or whatever, they're just those. And they're just like framed. And you recognize like, um, since I had been on that walk, you recognize some of those sites. And even if you hadn't been on that walk, you would recognize certain sites from, you know, like here's the B version of the photo that didn't end up in rings of Saturn. And so it's this weird dissociation from the text. Um, and then this weird dissociation from having, having traversed that landscape yeah i first i love that there are Z-Bald, uh nerds on the internet um <laughs> there are and they're wonderful <laughs> um but i also i think it's interesting to hear that process play out for you like, i probably shouldn't gosh i pro- yeah i'll probably get in trouble for that <laughs> i mean they're not nerds they're like scholars right you know they're they're like they're they're serious readers and scholars and academics but but we're having a casual conversation. Yeah, and I think you're also, I mean, I, charmingly, a, one of the more swashbuckling writers I know, and that, like, I, it wouldn't have surprised me that you had just asked to go see um, the pieces, and it doesn't surprise me, and I think that's the thing worth mentioning about you, that you've always been willing to be casual and go out and ask to try the thing and see the thing, which has um, gotten you out of the nerd camp from time to time while the rest of us uh, stay inside with our books. Oh, I definitely feel like I'm in that nerd camp, but... <laughs> while, we're, um, while we're talking about the nerd camp, can we uh, actually look at what you did finally choose to put in as your yeah. paragraphs in the Yeah. So this is uh, reading from the final version of Lines of Sight. The town of Dunwich once a thriving medieval port on England's Suffolk coast, has for centuries been crumbling into the sea. All that now remains of the old structures is a small collection of hilltop ruins, flanked by by a 19th century church and a handful of newer homes built far from the water's edge. Served by a single pub and a few guest houses, the local economy has has long catered principally to visitors, many of whom are part of a long line of artists and poets who have been drawn here since the Victorian age to contemplate the town's picturesque decay. I originally learned of Dunwich through W.G. Seabald's The Ring of Saturn, The Rings of Saturn, a book that cast a strange spell over me when I first read it, eventually compelling me to travel halfway across the world to see its somber sights for myself. In it, The author describes how Dunwich's church towers and graveyards, well shafts and walled fortifications, were all washed away, stone by stone, by the storms and encroaching waters of the North Sea. All of it has gone under, Seabald wrote, and now is is below the sea, beneath alluvial sand and gravel. The collapse of a community whose endurance must have always seemed certain to its residents even as its impending disappearance became self-evident, is emblematic of Seabald's obsessions. But Dunwich is distinct from a prototypical ghost town, noteworthy not for the faded allure of its architecture, but for the near total absence of its own ruins. Its former splendor, now entirely intangible, is something to be imagined rather than seen. Very cool. Um... So a dramatically different place to start, much more situated in the thing. And I would note also one of those moments where, um, you know, I recently, I don't, I'm in the process of a move and I've already sent some books ahead of me, including 
the line becomes a river. And so I was revisiting that book recently and I got the audio book and I was listening to it and realizing per usual how many words I pronounce wrong in my head. Um, Dunnage is not how I would have said that word. <laughs> D Dunwich is not how I would have said it either, but uh, I think once I once I was there, I I quickly corrected. <laughs> right um, so, uh, Francisco, you um, and our readers know, or our viewers know, that they can always find us at oneweekcritique.com, which is the number one. They can find both versions of your text there. Um, as well as all of our other interviews and the versions of those texts. Um, but I imagine they don't know where they can find you, um, request appearances, where they can buy your book, where they can find some of the projects you're doing. Right. I guess uh, tw Twitter is probably the best place for uh, r reaching out or just um, that's you know the place where I usually first post a new article or, or something like that. And uh, to plug the the VQR series, so the as I sort of alluded to, this this essay ended up being sort of the first of a triptych of these kind of um, literary or or uh, pilgrimages uh, taken around uh, significant cultural figures. Um, and so the the final part of that triptych was just published yesterday, um, and it's an essay all about uh, the Tejano star Selena. Um, who's a, another hero of mine. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, I also have a website with like, um, I think more contact info for like, uh, my, my agent and speaking stuff like that. And I, I also keep links, um, updated and yeah, there's a link to the book and there's a link to all these essays as well. Word. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Paco. It was a pleasure to have you. Yes, thanks so much. It, it was it was great being in conversation with you. And uh, yeah, I, we could do this for much longer, but um, we, we have to have mercy on your listeners. <laughs> so, so thanks for curating wonderful conversation.